Hi, it's Mr. G here today. And so we're going to be looking today at 2.1, how individuals make choices based on their budget constraint. And there is another video after this, uh, so we won't be covering all of 2.1 in this video. So there is an additional video to look out for that will cover some additional concepts. There's a lot of different concepts in this section uh, and a lot of things to discuss and understand in it. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at is the whole idea of a budget constraint. That's what we're starting off with. And so a budget constraint itself is fairly easy to understand. It's one of these models that, you know, it's fairly easy. Most of us know this intuitively, uh, so it shouldn't be that difficult. And uh, some people say it's unrealistic in terms of we're just going to deal with two products. Um, but remember, the whole idea of these models is to simplify it down to its basically basic variables for you to understand the concept so that you can understand what's going on with just two products, you can apply basically then what's happening with three products, four products. And trying to graph three uh, different products becomes more difficult, four products, etc. cetera. Um, and at this point, that is not what we are looking to do. So we're just dealing with a world with two products, okay? So first of all, let's look at this. So due to scarcity, we have constraints. We know that economics is making choices due to scarcity in the world. And we know money, time, etc., cetera, are all scarce in our lives. We don't have enough of it. We have to make choices. So we have limited money, which means a budget constraint. And you're like, well, really rich people, they don't have budgets and everything else. They don't have constraints. And you hear about these really rich people going bankrupt all the time. Why is that? Well, because they spend too much money. People can spend uh, huge amounts of money, uh, huge yachts, planes, etc. You can still spend more than you have and essentially go bankrupt. So limited money, and that applies for everyone, even the richest people in the world. They just have higher budget constraints. Limited money means budget constraints. Choices need to be made. The opportunity set identifies all the different combinations. So let's have a look at um, what basically the opportunity set is, okay? And so I have my scenario here, you can see it. Um, on the left side, you see my opportunity set right there. Uh, coffee and cookies, you see my graph. Uh, you see it says coffee, $2, cookies, $1 budget $24 in orange. And we're gonna be able to look at the graph and the opportunity set, and we'll be able to figure things out. So the first place to start is with the opportunity set. The opportunity set tells you what is possible. Remember, this is a budget constraint. So anywhere below the line you can do, you can decide to only buy one coffee and one cookie. That's within your budget constraint. You don't spend it all. Um, that's still possible. Remember, constraint is saying something we can't go beyond. But I can't buy 25 cookies and zero coffees. Why? Because that would be $25 and I only have 24. So we cannot move beyond the line, but we can also take any point below the line. We just don't spend our, our money. So on the budget constraint line, we're spending all of our budget, and that is the maximum. We can't go beyond that. Okay, so let's look at the opportunity set. Well, we know that cookies are $1 and coffee is two. So if coffee is $2, we can get 12 coffees. 12 times two, $24. Our whole budget is spent. We have nothing left to buy cookies with. Okay, this is zero cookies. That's the first one. The next one, 10. Well, we can buy 10 coffees at $2 a piece. We're at $20 um, and add on $4 for cookies. $24, that works too. And it keeps going with eight uh, coffees and eight cookies, or six coffees and 12 cookies, all the way up to no coffees and just 24 cookies, which is a lot of cookies. Um, and remember, it's just understanding this model, okay? Not that I'd expect you to eat 24 cookies in one go. Uh, so 24 cookies you can basically have and zero coffees. And so this is our opportunity set. And so you have to start with this, get all your points, all the numbers, all the different combinations that you can do, that your budget is zero. And um, basically you have, um, you know, uh, basically all the different combinations of things you can buy, okay? 
Then you plot all the points on the graph, and that's what I have here, all the points on the graph, and I draw a line, and that's my budget constraint. And so the budget constraint tells you the maximum you can spend, uh, but you can't go beyond that. And so it's saying you have to make a choice. It doesn't care where we are on the line. We could be, um, you know, at a point of eight and eight, so eight coffees, eight cookies. Or we could be pointing at uh, 12 and zero, 12 coffees and no cookies. It doesn't matter. We're still using all the money. We have to make the choice what combination we're actually going to choose. But these are all our possibilities that we can choose from. Okay? Um, if we look at this, it brings up the whole idea of opportunity cost. Now, opportunity cost is a very important concept. Opportunity cost is what you give up to get what you want. And you're like, okay, that's nice, but what does this all mean? But opportunity cost, if you understand it, it actually becomes really important. And a lot of students, they, when they think about it, because often we make choices and we don't think twice about it. But what opportunity cost is saying is that for every choice you make due to scarcity, remember that's what economics is, the decisions we make um, due to scarcity in the world, um, what, you know, whatever you choose, what you give up to get what you want. So if you make a choice, so I choose, I'm going to have uh, 12 coffees. Well, what is my opportunity cost? Well, it's going to be that I can't have any cookies. In this case, 24 cookies. I, you know, if I have 12 coffees, I can't have 24 cookies too. I don't have that kind of money. So my opportunity cost of having nothing but coffees is I can't have any cookies. Okay, so if we look at it and we simplify the numbers down, we look at it as if I have one cookie, I'm essentially giving up half a coffee. Why? A coffee is $2, a cookie is $1. To buy one cookie, you have to give up essentially half a coffee. And you're like, well, you wouldn't buy half a coffee. We're just interested in the, the numeric amounts here. Um, same with one coffee, you have to give up two cookies. So the opportunity cost for one coffee is two cookies. Opportunity cost for one cookie is a half a coffee. So there's also other opportunity costs. They don't have to be numeric. What's the opportunity cost of you not studying? Well, the opportunity cost of you not studying, maybe watching Netflix the night before, is that maybe you won't do well on a test. Okay, so you can get a poor mark, um, you know, or that you'll fall behind with your work, or that you won't understand the material. It's whatever you have to give up to make the choice you want. So those people who value their, you know, free time more often won't do as well in school. Why? Because they won't put the time into it because they'll always make the choice for their own free time versus schoolwork. And so that's a choice. But then they won't do as well in school. They may not get as good a job. Uh, whatever the outcome is, that is the opportunity cost. So every single decision you make due to scarcity, there is an opportunity cost. So like free goods... Things like air, you know, the oxygen we breathe, say fresh clean water in certain areas of the world. All of these, there's no opportunity cost with it. But um, for anything else that's scarce that we don't have a lot of, there is an opportunity cost for it. So how do we decide what to choose? How do we decide with the student, you know, the night before, who though some students are going to spend their whole evening studying really, really hard. And then there's going to be those students who are like, eh, I'll look at everything again in the morning just before the test. What is the difference between those two students? And it comes down to marginal benefit versus cost. Both of those students weighed the benefit versus the cost. Okay? For the person who decided to do nothing, they found it was more benefit just focusing in on their leisure time. They don't value school, so they don't see that they're giving up much. So there really isn't a cost factor for them. Either they're maybe not good at school, um, you know, maybe they just don't care, um, you know, whatever the reason might be, they're finding that it's more benefit to just, you know, spend less time trying to study and do well, and they don't really care as much about the cost. Remember, for us to choose something, the benefit has to be higher than the cost. For the person who spends all the evening study, yes, they'd rather be having leisure time, watching shows, you know, doing something fun. 
but they know that um, essentially the cost would be uh, of doing that is that they wouldn't get a good mark. And that's, you know, maybe they want to go on to a post-secondary institution that they really want and they have to keep up high grades. And they're like, well, no, I, it's not worth it. I want to get into that thing. I want the profession that I'm, I'm hoping for. And so for them, the cost is too high to do that. And so they will choose to study. But you see how it's the difference. They're both making choices. They're both making choices based on the scarcity of time. But essentially, each one is choosing differently. And it has to do with their benefit versus cost. The more you have of an item, the less you want. So this is interesting. It's like the more of an item you have, the less you want. So now it goes back to that whole scenario we had uh, up above here, you know, and where we had 12 coffees and 24 cookies, you know. Is someone really going to want 24 cookies? Are you going to sit down in one go and just have 24 cookies? I mean, I guess it depends how big they are. Sometimes you get these small little bite-sized ones, and that's not a problem. But if you're looking at a full-size cookie, um, 24 cookies is a lot of cookies. So if you're looking at that, we also look at things of what we call the law of diminishing marginal utility. It determines how we choose. So yes, we look at the benefit versus the cost. I'll give you an example. So I was on a cruise ship with a uh, bunch of my friends and, you know, we were in the dining room and we decided, you know, they're serving lobster tails and we'd have, you know, a little bit of an eating competition in terms of we're younger and, you know, it's like who can eat more lobster tails. And so, you know, the first one comes out and they're not big ones and it's like one, it's like, oh, that tasted good and, you know, great. Second one, that's fine. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth suddenly it starts going on and on and suddenly like oh that lobster tail that tasted so good the first one by the ninth or the tenth one it just doesn't taste as good anymore you, you know you don't really want another lobster tail and you know and eventually that goes on until it's actually a negative utility it's like actually eating another lobster tail is a negative experience for me okay and so we do that we look at how much satisfaction, which is what we call as utility, refers to satisfaction. And we'll cover this more in other chapters, but essentially how much utility does an object give us? Okay, how much satisfaction? And as we have more of something, it diminishes. Just think about, you know, some pop, if you like pop, or Coca-Cola, you can say specifically. So you have a glass of Coca-Cola and, you know, you drink one, that's great. Then the second one, okay, that's fine. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and suddenly you're like, I don't want any more. I've had enough. I, the, even the thought of having more would make you sick. It has a negative utility. And so this also ties into how we make choices. So the more we have of something, love diminishing marginal utility, diminishing means we reduce, marginal, just substitute the word extra. So diminishing extra utility, utility satisfaction. So we have reducing extra satisfaction. Okay, so the satisfaction goes down for every single item we have. That's essentially what this is saying. And that also determines how we choose. Now we have, a, like I said, this is a longer section. We have a lot of different topics. Uh, some of these we will cover in more detail in other chapters. So if you don't understand them completely, um, it's just important to see how everything ties together. Um, but we will cover a lot of these in more detail um, in later chapters. But budgets um, is what we're really covering today, the idea of opportunity cost as well. Um, and so now we're looking at, you know, this is a formula you can use uh, for uh, budgeting. Uh, it says P1 times Q1. Well, what does that mean? The price of one, so the coffee in this particular case, times Q1, the quantity of it. So in this particular case, um, $2 is the coffee times eight coffees. Well, that's 16. Plus the price of a cookie, which is P2. Uh, times Q2, which is the quantity of cookies that we have, which is also 8 in this case. So we have 2 times 8, 16, plus 8 is 24, and that's how we come up with our budget. So this is a formula you can use uh, for the budget constraints. So if you have the price and the budgets and one of the quantities, you can always solve for the other one. Okay, you just substitute in and then you solve, and you should know how to do that. 
Okay, so the next part we're looking at is sunk costs. Now, sunk costs are costs that incurred in the past and they cannot be recovered. You made a choice um, and now you're at a point where you have to make another choice. Um, it, the cost was already incurred in the past. The opportunity cost of, you know, uh, was incurred in the past and it cannot be recovered. So we'll go through the example. So you buy a movie ticket for $14. Halfway through, you think that it's an awful movie. It's a horrible movie. You don't like it. Well, what is really your choice at that point? You're halfway through a movie. You're not getting a refund. They're not going to give you a refund on a movie. So your choice is, because you're using scarcity of time. So your, your choice is about time now. It's not about the money. You've paid the money. It's a sunk cost. It shouldn't factor into your decision because you're not getting the money back. If you were to be like, well, you could get $7 back, well, then that's a different argument, but you're not going to. It's a sunk cost, so you don't concern yourself with the $14. You consider yourself with what's scarce now, time, and you make your choice based upon that. So halfway through, you think it is uh, awful. Should you leave or stay? Well, the thing is, you do marginal benefit versus marginal cost based upon time. And that's what you're looking at. Is it worth my time to stay? And you're looking at the benefit of staying and watching this movie. It's like, well, maybe I just like finishing a movie. I want to know how it ends versus the cost. Well, I'm wasting my time. I could go do something else instead. And that should really be uh, what you're looking at in that kind of decision. So sunk cost means you should ignore how much you paid, the $14, and your choice should be based purely on time. So that's what you should be going through on that. So a lot of different concepts in this section. We do have another video and some more to cover. Um, some of these concepts, like I said, we'll cover in more detail later on. Um, but it's important to at least start getting an understanding how things kind of work together. Okay, uh, that's it for now. Uh, stay tuned for the next part of this section.